five, scores! Rick Bob. We've decided to get ourselves back in the game again with our podcast. Rick Bob. Probably the craziest story that you're ever going to hear about hockey. We're going to be coming back to you on a regular basis. You are listening to Squid and the Ultimate Leafs fan. Hello, Canada and hockey fans of the United States and Newfoundland. And an extra big hello to Canadian servicemen overseas. Welcome, everyone, to episode 89 of the Squid and Ultimate Leaf Fan Show. I'm Mike Wilson, the Ultimate Leafs fan. Joining me, as always, my winger, Ricky Squid Vibe. Squid, you've had a busy week due to the exploits of one Maple Leaf in particular. Yeah, it has been a pretty crazy, wild uh, week for me, Mike. And uh, I I don't mind saying uh, I'm absolutely exhausted. And uh, but, it, but it was a wonderful week, uh, even though it was uh, pretty tiring, but it was it was unbelievable. I, I had a blast, and uh, it, it's been great. Fantastic. Well, our guest today, you both played for Canada at the 1978 World Juniors. He was chosen by the Buffalo Sabres in the 1978 draft, would go on to score 320 goals, 319 assists, play over 900 games, established himself in Buffalo, but had stops in Quebec, Minnesota, New York, Chicago, and St. Louis. I think it's safe to say it a reputation as an honest player who could play any way the game tilted. Please welcome Tony McKegney. First off, Tony, thanks for joining us today. And how you keeping? Yeah, very good. And uh, thanks for having me, guys. That's a real uh, – this week uh, I got caught up in everything that was happening. And, and I, I mentioned before that I, I forgot that Rick had scored three years in a row 50 goals. I thought it was two. And I got <laughs> to think back in, in my mind. And I hate to compare, uh, we were talking about it the other day, and I hate to compare anybody with anybody, but he reminded me uh, at that time of watching Tommy Simpson for the Toronto Toros, which I think yes. watching them. And I just, they're coming down the wing and that big rifle uh, off the side. And, and, you know, not many guys do that anymore uh, off the boards and, and can pump that shot far side, you know what I mean? Uh, but I mean, I just, that's what I thought about uh, back in the day. And plus, his name has been in the press every day this week, so it's, it's hard to ignore him. No, but it's really nice. Even over in the States here, um, it was quite nice. And I have CBC here, which is great uh, that we have it here on the border with Buffalo. And uh, just with the internet, uh, excuse me, the internet and so forth. And uh, it was something that for the younger people to think about, and the younger players, by the way, to think about how many goals that is. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of tucks. And I thought about the Team Canada team. And I was thinking about Wayne Gretzky, uh, Rick Vive, and then I thought about, I forgot about Mike Gardner, 700 goals. And then I'm probably third of the guys that played on that team uh, that made the NHL. Uh, Bobby Smith would be up there too. So those are the five names that from that team that went on to do uh, what we did uh, when we got to the show. Well, that was, I mean, that team is pretty strong, and I think we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. But, I mean, I think almost every player in that team played National Hockey League, I think, except one. Yep. So yeah, not, yeah. Only, not only that, I mean, I think everybody on that team that made it to the NHL played over 500 games. Yeah, probably. Yep, yeah. that would be correct. I mean, unbelievable. You, you look, you look at that '79 draft, and you see Michel Goulet is the last pick in the first round by the Quebec Nordiques. Yeah. And everybody looks at that and goes, "Well, why would he go so late?" Well, that was already predetermined before the draft because. Right. Of the- Hey, Squid, another one for you. Uh, Mike Bossy gets taken 15th, right? Uh, yeah, five, four. yeah, five right wingers got taken before him in 77, before Mike Bossy. Yeah, well, somebody knew what they were doing because he went on to score nine consecutive 50 <laughs> seasons yeah. at the end of his career. Now, yeah. Now, Tony, we just want to we just want to get through to you. So, uh, what are you doing these days? Uh, any projects or involved in hockey or anything at all? Yeah, I'm uh, doing some volunteer work, and uh, I go to a lot of the Sabres games. Um, and then my son lives here, and uh, we're working on this documentary piece, one of those thirty for thirty things, which got slowed down with the COVID, uh, because most of the people were coming from Canada to come to the states, and then vice versa. So. That held us up for probably, I'd say, a year. Uh, it slowed it down. Um, so anyway, in saying that, um, just like being back in Buffalo, I, I wish the team was better, but I still enjoy watching the games. I told Squid a funny story that uh, when I was playing for my years, 15 years, I uh, hung out with uh, the Swedish guys a lot. Matt Sundin uh, became friends. Um, 
And then Boria, uh, he and I became friends when he came to Detroit and then after the fact. And then uh, Kent Nielsen and just different guys. And I learned how to say, hello, how are you? Good morning uh, in Swedish. Right? My brother played in Lulio in Sweden. So I was just, I had this attachment to the Swedish guys. I, I just liked them and we, they like beer. So anyway, um, uh, the, the Swedish guys, six of them move into my building in Buffalo. And they're down in the parking lot and the moving guys are moving the stuff in. And I, I see the cars of these kids driving a $150,000 car like I am. So sure enough, uh, I'm talking to them in Swedish and they're saying, who the hell is this black guy in the city of Buffalo speaking Swedish to us? And no idea. So the next day I left a picture signed with me and Jumar Perot on every one of their windshields. So the next time they saw me, like, no idea. They weren't even born when I retired. Kids are like 22, 23 years old. No idea that I played in the NHL. Well, that's uh, it's funny. Uh, it's funny you say that, Tony, because I met, I went down Monday uh, to the Leaf dressing room, the practice facility, and, and hung out there for for the day. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking around and going, "There's probably only four guys on this team that were born when I was playing." <laughs> yeah, and they, if that, if that. I mean, yeah, really. I mean, their parents weren't born. <laughs> okay, well now you're making me look feel real old. Like, well, yeah. think about it. That's forty years ago. Yeah, Squid, uh, Squid, you're still younger than me, and you scored a hundred more goals than I did. <laughs> so now, Tony, what's the what's the your son's doing a documentary? Is he in that world, or is he just doing? Is this uh, actually, project? Uh, he's just a kid that's um, very well to do, and. Um, He's very uh, perse uh, perseverance, I should say. And he, he actually thought about the idea. And uh, he's really into um, the fact that there's many more minor minority, excuse me, players in the league now. And he just, he thinks it's come a long way. Uh, he just thinks that the, maybe the league could do more, more so. Um, and um, I happen to think the league is doing a pretty good job and you can't do everything, I guess, but I mean, uh, this Anthony, this Anthony Duclair kid, uh, kind of reminds me of me. Uh, the way he plays, and it, it's and, and that Simmons kid plays with grit, and you know, so uh, every night I turn on the highlights, and there's there's one um, uh, person of color doing something in a game, and it just I, I you know, 20 years ago, uh, I wouldn't have imagined that. And the same thing as Squid said, uh, if we'd have told me 20 years ago that some kid from Phoenix, Arizona, was going to break my record, like who would have thought? Like how does that happen? Well, I don't think anybody would have believed that uh, 20 or 30 years ago if, they had, if, if yeah. anybody had said that. But, um, but if you watch, I mean, he trained so hard in the offseason to be better every year. And if you look from year one to year six, you can see a notice, noticeable difference in his maturity and, and how strong he's gotten. And also, I mean, his skill level is off the charts. I was going to say, Tony, what's, and, and Squid, you can jump in here too. What's the biggest change? And Squid and I've discussed this a lot. You've seen since you played in the 70s, since you do go to a lot of the games. What's one of the things you notice about the game of hockey as it is today presented by the NHL? Well, uh, there used to be a couple scraps every period. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen one fight. I've been to 11 Sabres games. Uh, I haven't seen one fight uh, at that arena. Uh, this season. <laughs> Uh, I went to New York and it was classic and there, I went Black History Month and there, somebody got elbowed and knocked out in the second period and the whole crowd knew it was coming. So sure enough, third period, you knew it was coming and it was down at the end I was at and uh, the two tough guys just found that time and they were going to, you know, uh, make up for somebody getting drilled. So th that doesn't happen anymore. And, and the other thing I, I was telling Squid that when the Sabres didn't start that well, and, and they're just starting to play better now, which is great uh, for the city and for everybody. And I'm looking forward to tonight, by the way. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, good rivalry. Uh, so anyway, I was telling Squid that the, the, they were kind of weak from the hash mark down in your defensive zone. And I'm, okay, right, okay. Uh, and then they're weak on the offensive zone uh, from the hash marks down. And to me, I was sitting back and thinking about the two most important places to me in the rink are those areas. If you're a goal scorer, or if you're defenseman defending. So those are the two areas to me that you, you got to tune it up uh, basically and, and get better at that. And uh, when you watch the good teams in the league, uh, I would sit back and, and watch the top five teams and say, what are they doing? I'd watch a video of them 
and how are they doing this? And, and we're not doing this uh, at watching the good teams and the good players. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the game has changed a lot over the years, obviously, since we played so many. But, I mean, I think the Sabres, if you look at the prospects that they have, they've got a couple more in Rochester. They've got yeah. a lot of draft picks coming up in the next two or three drafts. And I believe that, you know, four or five years from now, this is going to be a team that's going to be near the top of the league. Well, my view on it was, and I think we've talked about this before, is, is I mean, keeping everything relevant regarding new equipment, sticks, and so on, I'd say one of the biggest changes in the league has been the development of the bottom six forwards and the bottom four D. With the odd, with I would say with the odd exception, and this is a this is a a, a sort of a, um, an, an admiration for your game for you guys. With the odd exception of saying the older days compared to today, the top six and the top four would probably be equally as skilled and equally as fast. I would bet, but it's overwhelmingly differences between the speed and skill of those bottom guys who now skate as good as the top guys both on forward and defense. Would you guys agree with that? Go ahead, Rick. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think, and, and I've talked to a couple of, I, I remember this one gentleman on a great uh, leaf rink one day, and he came in, and he had worked with Hockey Night in Canada for many years. And he said, you know, I, I said, boy, oh boy, I said, we, we got to talk. And I said, is, the, is that game ever fast now compared to where we play? And he said, you know what? He said, I've been upstairs, downstairs, ice level, watching games for so many years. He said, I think the top six forwards in the league today are about the same as they were when you played. He's, and he, he said that. He said, the bottom six, it's a big difference. Hey, Rick, I was going to say, I was with Will Paymont the other day at a thing for Rick Jennerat, uh retiring, obviously. Yeah. His year and, uh, raising the thing, and and uh, so sure enough, uh, Wolf reminded me that our third line in Quebec, our third line, uh, scored 105 goals, and we were the third line. Uh, <laughs> Wolfie had 39, I had 20 something, five, and then Andre Savard, and we were the third line on the team. Although Wolfie got a little bit of power playing time, but we were behind uh, the Stastny's, Dale Hunter, Goulet. And then we were the third line. But the thing is, we got a lot of ice time because we, we would play against the other team's top lines every game. So we got to play against, uh, we had a lot, a lot of ice time uh, yep. in that that uh, realm. But it's just kind of funny thinking about the top six, you say, uh, top six forwards. But I told this uh, this Tuck kid the other day and, and one of the other young kids that live in the building. And I told his dad, I said, look, just don't ever give up a shot. I was telling Squid this yesterday. And and I said, don't, don't miss the net because if you hit the net, there might be a rebound. Right. And I, I told the story about Danny Gare got 56 goals one year and I guarantee 25 of them were off rebounds that he was just there in the right place. You know, you, you get down low and, and the puck jumps free and, and you're you're there. Uh, Dino Cicerelli made a living out of it times 608 goals, uh, just being in the right place, at the right time, right down low. Uh, just, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty amazing. Yeah, I, got, I probably got half my assists on rebounds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Squid, we voted you for the Cy Young every year. <laughs> you won the Cy Young Award every every friggin' year. <laughs> hey, okay. yeah. Yeah. hey, now, I mean, Tony, you've sort of touched on this already, but I identified you as an honest player, you know, during your career. Would you like to see players place themselves more in today's game? Um, I, I guess so. I just like, you know, back in the day, you sort of had your role and, and uh, some of it came down to how much money you're making. I remember when I was I was in the top two people in St. Louis with Gil Gilly and uh, Ray for Durko. And like there was pressure every night to say, oh, you're making uh, 300 grand or whatever, 350. And uh, you better produce tonight. You know, like you have to win the game for us. So everybody knew how, how much everybody else was making. And it was sort of like. You know, uh, you better score tonight, uh, buddy. Uh, we're counting on you. And uh, you didn't. And you lost the game by a goal. It was like, you know, what did you do tonight? Sort of thing. And I'm squid. Did you feel sort of the pressure to score? Like after you scored, put up 50. It's like, do you feel the, uh, the obligation to do that every year? Sort of thing? No, you know, I, I kind of had a job. I don't know. I, I, whether I was blessed with it or born with it, I don't know. But I just had the ability to kind of put those things aside and not worry about them and just yeah, okay. 
and, and I, I was good with that. I mean, I uh, I didn't put pressure on myself, and I didn't listen to people. Uh, I mean, yeah, I read the newspapers. I read the oh, I never, I don't read the papers. It's just full of shit. Yeah. And and I don't watch TV. I don't watch the uh, sports channels. Yeah, it's full of shit. But it's I was good. able to, regardless of what was said, to have it roll off my back. Yeah, you know, and, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, didn't didn't it, let it bother me. Yeah, uh, for me, it's quite interesting. I'm just going to get your opinion on it. Um, I never thought I would never score again. And I knew some guys that were goal scorers and said, geez, I, I can't, I don't know if I'm going to get another one or something, right? <laughs> and I knew every day it was just a matter of time that I was going to get a goal. I, I knew. Uh, but some guys oh. were just like, hey, geez, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, God, I, I had times where I didn't score for eight or ten games. Mm-hmm. But I never, ever thought that it was going to continue. I knew that one of them, my next one was probably going to go off my ass or my leg yeah. or something. Right. And then the next 10 games, I was going to probably get 15 of them, you know. So uh, I, I never worried about that. Right. Good. Well, you know, uh, Tony, uh, we had Danny Gear on podcast oh, a few months ago, and he was talking about he went up to Joe Perot when he had enough nerve to go and speak to him one day to ask him, how do you do it? And, you know, how, how does it all come to you? And he just kind of shrugged him off and he said to him, look, you just do what you have to do because if you score 40, you want 50. If you score 50, they want 60. All right, you yeah. never satisfy them, right? So he said, yeah. just stay consistent. Put your numbers up. Because think about it, Squid. You go from scoring, Tony, you guys, you go from scoring 40 goals, you scored a 20 and a goal, you had an awful year. But meanwhile, you're one of the top scorers on the team still. Yeah, I told uh, Squid uh, that one of the kids, uh, to, he's in and out of the lineup here, uh, Jorgensen, he went to Yale. And I said I scored 20 goals when I was older uh, in a season. Um, and I thought my career was over. And he said, 20 goals. He said, that's, <laughs> he said, that's $3.5 million today. And I, I, I was ready to pack it in. And I ended up playing <laughs> four more years after that, but I was ready to get out of there. Uh, yeah, I was just, just disappointed in myself basically. And I thought when you score 40 and you drop down to 20, it's like, uh, what are you doing? Uh, right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a tough pill, I guess, to swallow, but at the same time, uh, you, you look at it and you say, well, how many guys in the league are scoring 20 plus goals? Yeah. Fact, then, you know, yeah, you had your top guys that were scoring 50, 60, 70, whatever you had a Sprinkle in a few guys in the 40s and 30s, but 20 to 25 goals was a pretty good season. Yeah. Hey, Squid, I, I had a question for you. Um, take out Gretzky, take out Lemieux, uh, take out Bobby Orr, uh, take out maybe Messier. Uh, after that list of guys, who who would you think is the best guy that you played against? And, and I'll, I'll tell you my guy, uh, but tell me your guy uh, outside of those four guys. What were the four again? Gretzky, Messi, uh, Gretzky, and or, or uh, Lemieux, yeah. Messi, uh, those guys. So, you know the typical, yeah. uh, maybe Bossy. The obvious guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What would after that? What, who's a, what do you think is that? Because I got my, I, I got, I know the guy I, I want to uh, pick. I'm just trying to think. I mean, I think. Well, one guy that. It took him a long time to win, but he, he was a good player, and then he, he kind of came into his own later on, and that was Steve Eisenman. Oh, sure. Oh, Steve. And, yep. Yep. Well, that's I think Steve. he was one of the better players in the league that yep. it took him a long time to get adapted yep. to the league. Oh, so Squid, uh, again, uh, you played in that era when he came in, and my, my guy was Rick Middleton. Oh, yeah. He was yeah. pretty good, too. Yeah. <laughs> Nifty. Yep. Uh, my guy was Rick Middleton, uh, nifty, because we played Boston eight. To, uh, one year we played him 16 times, uh, seven playoffs, eight regular season, and then two exhibition, 19. Anyway, I saw Rick Middleton every year at the time, <laughs> and, and he was penalty killer, great, great skater, uh, scored 50 goals. Like, And, and I was going to talk about the Hall of Fame uh, squid with you in mind and Rick Middleton. Uh, what bothers me is that uh, Trekshack's in the Hall of Fame. Um uh, we in Buffalo, uh, they lost 12 to six with him in goal. Uh, we beat him six one in 1980 before the Olympics in 80 in Buffalo, six to one. He was a net. Uh, like, you know, why is he in before you and Middleton and these guys? 
that you know they you know he never played here gold medals well so uh they, they oh, didn't uh, they, yeah. they were looking at his career and oh, how many gold yeah, medals he won yeah. with a russian team that were basically pros yeah against amateurs no i i agree i agree you know so i don't think it's probably fair but at the same time i mean the guys that came over here from russia and played in the nhl yeah i know Benisov and Makarov yep. and all those guys yeah, yeah, they, they, they contributed in the nhl um, but Gil, yeah but i mean I, i'd rather see rick vive uh in there uh rick middleton yeah uh i'd rather from my ex uh, experience of playing those against those guys my whole career um I never, uh, Trechak was their goalie coach and he brought Dominic Hasek over, uh, when I was in Chicago. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the only time I ever met him. Well, let's, um, let, let's go back and test your memory, Tony, and let's get to where you are today. And starting back, you're born in Montreal, raised in Sarnia. How did you start off playing in hockey? And you followed in your older, older brother's footsteps playing junior B in Sarnia, but take us through that period ending up in Kingston. Actually, um, it's, it was Pretty simple. I was adopted when I was quite young, and uh, my parents uh, built a hockey rink uh, every winter. And uh, when I was quite young, I remember looking out the, the window from the bedroom upstairs, which overlooked the hockey rink, and uh, there were lights up there. My dad, you know, it was, it was a huge hockey rink with nets and boards and everything that they did. And uh, when I, I used to look out at the kids on the rink, and, and I wondered what they were doing when I was like two years old. And I couldn't wait to get out there. And I had the older brothers and that was always hand-me-downs with equipment. So he always had skates and this, and my dad used to buy a dozen hockey sticks uh, that were in the basement. So he always said, yeah, we, knew, we had everything that you wanted. But I mean, it was like having a basketball court in your backyard where you could just walk outside from December yeah. until March the 15th and have your own hockey rink. And I remember when I couldn't sleep at night, I'd look outside and my mother and dad took turns every hour watering the rink when it was the coldest from one, two, three, four, five in the morning. Uh, so I had the advantage of playing against older uh, people because my brothers were four and, and six and 10 years older than me. So I was always playing against their friends. So when I got to play with my age range at five years old and, and playing uh, my hockey, I, I just kicked ass because I said, holy shit, I, I just dominated some, some 10 year olds. And uh, so now I'm with my own age group. I go, this is easy. And my dad told me something very interesting. When my brother went to Kitchener, junior A, my brother went to university, my brother went to the Navy. So I was by myself outside of my Navy, my sister. And he said, if you're gonna be on the ice by yourself, make sure you put a puck on your stick all the time. And he said, just do drills if you're out there, but make sure you have a puck all the time as you're skating, just get used to doing that. And it was the best advice uh, he ever gave me, uh, my dad. So you would go from Sarnia, how do you end up in K Kingston? Uh, just, uh, I knew when I was probably 13 years old that I was going to get drafted to go to junior A. Uh, I saw what was there and I was playing junior B when I was 14, 15 and I, I had 95 points or something when I was 15 years old playing against 19 year olds. Uh, you can see the picture. So I'm 15 years old and I'm thinking, okay, well, uh, junior A, like I'm, I'm just waiting to go to the national hockey league at that point. I'm just waiting. Uh, so you go to Kingston and you know, uh, you just, you put your time in uh and just you know put the points up and, and play and just wait to get drafted and then the next step's the nhl so it just i, I knew in my mind uh that's where i was going uh no no ifs ands or buts about it because uh, i saw guys in junior that were getting drafted in the first round and i was outscoring them when i was 16 years old and i'm thinking well, these guys are getting drafted in the first round i just outscored uh, bruce Brugger or somebody uh or whoever um, so, you know, it's 16, 17, you're just waiting. So talk about your Kingston years there. You played with some pretty good players in Kenny yeah. Lindsman, Larry Murphy and some of the guys. Yeah. Yeah. Kenny Linsman and, uh, Ben Wilson was there my last year. Mike Crombie, uh, great junior right. player. You played with the rat? Uh, Kenny. Yeah. Actually his mother died, uh, my first year there. Uh, of cancer. So he basically had every meal at my billet's house uh, during the course because his father was trying to raise five kids. So Kenny came to our house uh, to have dinner every day. 
uh, and live there uh, basically. So that's, and then we, you know, same team and stuff, but yeah, that, that's how we became close. And uh, I almost went to Birmingham uh, before uh, Squid went there and uh, Kenny was there. I wanted to go play with him again. Yeah. And we knew Birmingham maybe had a year. That was, that was a rumor. And uh, I ended up going to Buffalo. It, it worked out great, but I mean, uh, the, the baby bulls happened uh, during that whole time. All this stuff went down within six weeks or something. Uh, met with uh, Bassett, John Bassett, and uh, anyway, Squid and the guys ended up going there, and uh, they all did well uh, from that experience. Now, Squid, in, in retrospect, are you glad you went for that year? Because uh, I, I wanted to go just make money <laughs> and get out of junior, making nineteen bucks a week. <laughs> yeah, 19, 19 to 10 a week, I think I made. And, uh, you know, I, I think my biggest thing was I wanted to play against men. I wanted to get out of junior because, I mean, I scored 76 goals my yeah. second year after 51 the first year. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I need to play against men so I can get better. And sure. I thought that was the best road for me. And uh, it ended up being a pretty good experience for me and playing with some pretty good guys down there. Now, and I think it hurt me a little bit my first year in the NHL because I went in there and I thought it was going to be easier than it, was, than it actually was. Right. It was, I had a good year in Birmingham and I figured, oh, can't be that far off. But it was. The NHL was much better. Of course, the merger happened too, so there was more of all those WHA players were coming back to the NHL. Yep. And it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Okay. And Squid, how many did you get that year in uh, Birmingham? I have, I didn't look it up, but I I, I did remember. Twenty six. Okay, that's great. yeah. And yeah. how many? What what Goulet get that year? Because I didn't really know about him before. Uh, he, uh, he he had about I, I don't know. I might have had twenty nine, and he had twenty four or twenty. Yeah, you guys were in that range, right? Hartsey was yeah, there. Yeah, I had about six, 59 points or something. Well, you led yeah. the team in scoring your first year, and you and you had like two hundred minutes in penalties. Yeah. Yeah, 248. 248 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Squid, were, were you having a bad day? <laughs> well, you know what? It's funny. Again? Because, again? Uh, the year before we got there was when Birmingham had all the tough guys. Well, Frank, Frank. beat the hell out of every Frank team. Beaten, right? So they bring in all us 19-year-olds, and Michelle Goulet was only 18. Yeah. And they had no tough guys left except for Dave Hanson. He's the only guy we have. So yeah. now all the other teams rolled up and it's payback time. And you know what? I, I just, it was the way I always kind of played when I was growing up is that, you know, no one's going to make me leave the right play. In other words, you're not going to scare me. So I'm going to fight you. And if you break your knuckles on my helmet, then, you know, uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to want to fight me anymore. <laughs> So, boys, 1978, first time Canada selects a national team to play in the World Juniors in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Tony, how'd you find that you've been selected? Actually, we had a training camp, uh, Squid. You probably remember that summer at the Orwell uh, camp. Yes. Uh, Squid, you were there, Squid, obviously, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we had the uh, summer camp, and I I'd scored 71 goals the year before. Um, and uh, it was third in the scoring in Ontario a League, right? And that, that's including the playoffs, by the way. So yep. anyway, uh, they, you sort of knew when you got there how you lined up. and, and But the surprise was that uh, and Billy Drulego was there and, and uh, Malinowski and these guys and Bobby Smith and uh, the typical Brian Walter and the typical guys you, you'd see and, and you'd know about. So anyway, uh, Gretzky wasn't even a thought because he'd just been drafted and everybody's going to the Sioux. He's 16 years old and not even a consideration. So uh, sure enough, uh, as you said, before the camp, uh, Billy D breaks his leg. Uh, yeah. scored nine goals a year before, and he was slotted to be number one. I was going to play with Wayne Babich and Bill Durlego. So he gets hurt, and then I was going to play with Bobby Smith, okay, first line, Wayne Babich, and uh, Squid was with um, um, the guy from Cornwall, uh, Ricky Patterson, and yeah. the French. I yeah. played with the, the other two guys from the Quebec team. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were they were the, they were the number or not you know they were line and and then we were line. Um, so anyway, Gretzky comes in um, you know a week before he finds out and he comes in with Hartsburg, and uh, he just lit it up uh, from the beginning. And I hadn't seen him that season yet because we hadn't played Sault Ste. Marie yet. Uh, it was Christmas time. And we were going to see them till March or February or something. So I just saw the, the line scores every day, and, and he's putting up two and three points a game. I go, who is this? Like, how are you doing this? 
And uh, I hadn't seen it live. There was no internet back then. There was no TV, so you couldn't watch it. There was no replays. There was no nothing. It's just you look at the paper and go, "Geez, one goal, two assists." And it's like, uh, "How's he doing this?" So anyway, uh, comes to camp, and uh, it was it was the easiest game I played because he used to say to me, he "said Look, uh, when we get down there, just go there, and I'll find you." And sure enough, I went there, and he found me uh, every time. Every I never never played with anybody like that before. That you know, you just go to an area and bang, it's there. Aside from the game, Tony, okay, like take us through. I mean, I know what it was like, but we dressed in Montreal's weight room. Like they took their weight stuff, they had stalls put in there. So yeah. we're walking around the dressing room every day, showering in the showers. We're watching them practice every day, like. Yeah. Like, what was it like for you? Because for me, it was uh, Squid, I'm glad you brought that up, Squid, because my, my uh, favorite memory is that uh, the Montreal Canadiens are right in the middle of winning four straight Stanley Cups, Guy Lafleur. And, uh, the guy I got to know and reached out to me was uh, two guys, Yvonne Lambert and Pierre LaRouche. So Yvonne Lambert gave me a dozen of his coho sticks, and I'll, I'll never forget that. And so he gets traded to Buffalo. And now he's like my left winger in Buffalo. <laughs> and he remembered, he remembered me the dozen sticks, right? So the other one squid, and you remember this. It, I told Gretz about it. We had a golf tournament with Mike Weir. Uh, and sure enough, uh, I told Gretz, and he just laughed at me. I was waiting for the plane. So sure enough, uh, at the uh, we had a dinner at uh, either Jacques Lemaire's restaurant or one of the guys had a restaurant there, Cornway or somebody, right, a sports bar. So sure enough, uh, the whole team's there with their Team Canada suits and pants on, all ma matching, right? So the other, the only guy that's not there is Wayne Gretzky. So we're sitting around. It's a luncheon. Where, where's Gretzky? Everybody's looking around. Obviously, he's the talk of the town and everything. Uh, he comes in with a broad uh, 30 minutes late for the luncheon. And we're just sitting there all individually, you know, just with the coach of the GM. And, and, and Gretz brings a girl uh, to the luncheon. <laughs> and I remind him of that. And he just looked at me. He says, well, uh, that's what I did. <laughs> 60 years old. And he's going to guy in the team, and he's got the girl. Uh, he brought the girl to the lunch. And we're, now, all we're all 19 years old. Nobody even think about doing that. Now, for you guys, you can both answer this one again. Um, first off, everybody should be aware, and we've talked about this a lot, that team was loaded, as we know. Like, most of the guys played 500 games, so we've established yeah. that. Yet yep. you still finished third. So two things here. Number one, Tony, I'll go to you first in this one. Was this an awakening to you to the fact the rest of the world was playing this game and they were pretty good at it? And number two, when the tournament was completed and you went back to your teams, what did you take away from the tournament um, for yourself as a professional and for the game of hockey? You know, it's interesting. And Squid, um, I wasn't cognizant of the names on the other teams' players. And when I look back at the guys that were on Czechoslovakia, Russia, Sweden, and Finland, like though, there was a bunch of names that uh, our age group swim that went on to play in the national hockey league. You just didn't yeah. know about them because they weren't yeah. able to defect there. They were coming in droves at that point. Other, outside of Boria and Nielsen and Hammerson and those guys, nobody was really coming over from Sweden and the Russians hadn't come yet sort of thing. And the, the Czechs, uh, the Stasi were a couple of years later uh, and those guys were on the team. So you look back at it and I, I thought we get out coached. Uh, I thought there was some uh, agendas going on, and I thought there was a game I told Squid. We were playing in Quebec against the Russians, and I watched the tape, and Wayne Gretzky and I, leading the, the, the tournament in scoring, got two shifts in the first period. And Stan Smeal and Ryan Walter and Steve Tambellini, these guys, are getting like uh, eight shifts in a period, and we're sitting on the end of the bench. And I'm looking at it going, What? Right. And uh, anyway, that one game that we lost three to two in Quebec and uh, Wayne had five breakaways and didn't score in one of them. So he got pinched. Yeah. No, no, no. But I mean, not blaming him, but I mean, it just happened. No, Fetisov, I know. I'm kidding. Yeah. Fedosov was uh, out in the ice. Every time we're on the ice, Fedosov was out there uh, back in the day. Yeah, I think uh, I'd have to agree with you, uh, Tony, that, that and I, I don't mean out coach, but but Punch McLean was was from New Westminster. He was the head coach. There was three other coaches. Orville Tessier was from the Quebec League. And he he told us our line after the tournament was over that their plan was every first period ever they were gonna play four lines. 
And then if it was a close game, they were going to cut back to three lines, and sometimes they might take a guy off one line and put him on another line. Well, that never happened. It was our line that sat out pretty much every game in the second and third periods. I also believe, and this is nothing against Stan Smeal or any of those guys that played like that because they had great NHL careers. But I don't believe those guys were suited for this type of hockey. You know, and uh, and we had a lot of them. We had, uh, oh gosh, the guy who played in Chicago, tough guy. Uh, uh, Kurt, Kurt, Fraser. Kurt Fraser. Kurt Fraser, Stan Smeal. Uh, I can't remember some of the other guys. But uh, the guy in defense was Brian Young. Yeah, from the West. I'm younger, yeah. And I just don't think they picked a team that was really suited for that type of hockey. Well, there, there was two guys who we talked about, Daniel Mechave out of the Quebec League and uh, one other guy that uh, scores that we probably could have used. And we're playing mm-hmm. Quebec, Quebec City, Cornwall. Like we're, That's where we're playing our games. Like, we should have had five or six French guys on the team, I think. Yeah, there was uh, a couple of guys in the Quebec League. Sylvain Loca was a smaller oh, yeah. guy, but boy, could he skate. He was uh, he Yeah, was Kevin Reeves. Kevin Reeves. Points a year. Yeah, Kevin Reeves. Remember him, Squid? Yes, he was playing for the Montreal Junior Canadiens. And yeah. He was right. a good, fast player. And, you know, so, I mean, you know, it is what it is, and we won a bronze. Uh, we didn't get shut out, so, yeah. I mean, you look at it and say, well, we did okay, considering they had a very good team, Sweden and Russia as well. So, you know, you can't say, well, we deserve the gold. I mean, they were good teams. Hey, uh, Squid, I got I to gotta ask you a question, because I have this memory. Uh, we beat the Russians um, one of the first – Two games that we played, we won a game in Cornwall, eight to nothing against uh, Denmark or somebody, right? And then we beat the Russians seven to three at the Forum, and it was a pretty close game after the first period. And then, honest to God, Squid, I thought they laid down, and I, I thought that was a game plan because we just they they were just they were stopped dead in the sand, right? So we 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 had to go out and get five or six goals straight, uh, beat them seven to three. We're overconfident, uh, I was. Uh, after beating them seven to three, but I think they they played possum. I, I truly thinking back there, I think they laid down because it was a different team we played in Quebec. Uh, well, didn't five, they do that in the '81 Canada Cup? Remember the t- the team beat them in the regular in the preliminary round, smoked them, and then in the final they just killed Canada. Uh, eight to one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they were noted for doing that. Well, uh, I figured it out later. I said, "Geez, like the two different teams." Uh, yeah. That we played against. Now, Tony. So interesting. Pulled off some uh, crazy shit over the years. I mean, I remember we're in the World Championships in Finland, and we're I have a water guys. And them are playing in the last game, and if Russia wins, we're going to get the silver. Yep. If the Czechs win, then they get the silver, or they or if they tie. Yeah. Well, they tied they tied zero zero the Russians and the Czechs to like, shut you guys out. Russians were dumping it in, they weren't going after it or anything, and it tied zero zero, and we get the bronze and the check and the silver. So, but we got them back in a couple of years later, and uh, Czechoslovakia, we beat the Russians for the silver, and they ended up with the bronze. So we got those buggers back. Now, Tony, I want to get into uh, your draft year. Now, you obviously had you were confident with your ability that you were going to get taken by somebody. Mm-hmm. But what kind of chatter were you hearing as the year went along? And when how did you find now back in those days the draft was a lot different as you know, it's not like today. It was by a phone call. Where were you when you got called? Who called you and how did it all uh, happen? I I think um I was I went to Montreal for the draft. Okay. Uh, with with actually Dave Hunter. We took the train together. And it was at the uh big hotel in, in the Queen Elizabeth in Montreal. And it was actually the first year that they invited all the potential draftees to the draft. And you didn't have your parents, you didn't have, but I met with uh, the owners of the team, Buffalo Sabres. They knew before uh, I got drafted that they were picking me. I met with Punch Imlac and met with the coach uh, who was there, uh, Marcel Pronovo. So, uh, well, no, Smitty was gone, but Marcel Pronovo was there, but Smitty was gone. 
Yeah, yeah. But uh, I was going to say that uh, I was in Montreal and I, I knew beforehand. I signed a contract that day and squid something about Birmingham. And that sort of threw a mix uh, of, 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 you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> a wrench in the mix about the whole thing and the Birmingham thing signed there. And uh, that the fans, you know, were worried about a, a black person coming to play there. So as it turned out, I ended up going to the NHL, which I wanted to go. I got go to a place close to home, Buffalo Sabres, close to Canada. My parents came to the games. I had a bunch of relatives in Hamilton, Niagara Falls, Niagara in the Lake, uh, Toronto, and all these friends I knew. Hey, coming to Buffalo for a hockey game, great, 90 minutes. So in, in retrospect, I came to the NHL, and Birmingham ended up becoming defunct after that year. So in retrospect, and I ended up getting a signing bonus from Birmingham. And then two weeks later, uh, the thing got nixed. <laughs> so then I get a signing bonus from Buffalo after I get drafted by Buffalo in, in the same summer. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks to Billy Robert, uh, thanks to Billy, Billy uh, Waters and uh, Rick Curran for that one. Now, um, Talk about your your first draft, your first camp, pardon me, after you get drafted. How, take us through all that. How, what were your expectations going into camp besides well, making the team? It was funny back then, and Squid will remember, we had a rookie camp. So I'm so pumped up about going to Buffalo. And there was there was one spot available, apparently. That was the rumor. And I knew a couple of guys. I talked to a couple of guys. I said, hey, there's there's one left wing spot available. I talked to Terry Martin. I talked to a few of the boys, Danny Gear. And Gilbert Pearl. So sure enough, um, I lighted up for the first seven days of camp. I was skating four days a week in Sarnia in a summer hockey camp. And I was working out Nautilus. I was just like, you know, 205 pounds, four, four ounces of the body fat and skate like the wind. And so I get to camp and I'm just, you know, uh, half the guys aren't in shape. So sure enough, after a week, the veterans come to camp. And the trainer is bringing out Gilbert Pearl skates. He hadn't seen them since the last game of the season, right? Been at the cottage. So Richard Martin, oh, Rick, here's your skates. Uh, you know, hadn't seen anything, right? Jerry Korab, all these guys hadn't skated. So sure enough, the first three days of camp, I'm blown by everybody because I'm in shape, right? And the guys are looking at me going like, like one-on-ones, I'm going right around these defensemen, like just flying. And uh, so I, I, the, the biggest thing for me is that they told me uh, two things. You can get a home. Uh, great. And then you can move into the uh, big team's locker room. And then I knew I was in, uh, which was great. Uh, I'd been in the hotel for five weeks at that point uh, before I got the, the news that I could I could move out of the hotel and move into the uh, actually moved in the regular locker room pretty soon after I uh, we went to Buffalo from St. Catharines in the training camp. Yeah. So I uh, uh, it was just nice to say, hey, you made the team, uh, made the team. Yeah, it's funny, it's funny you say that about camp because I remember, you know, when I got a little bit older, my fifth or sixth year in the league, and we're in training camp, and there's probably three or four guys that are just lying out there because they worked their tails off all summer, they worked out all summer, they skated all summer. And most of us skated the whole month of August, so we do a little workouts on bikes and stuff, but we didn't do a ton of stuff. But by the end of training camp, we we all caught up to those guys, <laughs> and then they got sent to the minors. Now, Tony, how did you end up in Hershey? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you another story, Squid, about uh, uh, sure. Bob, uh, Bobby Plager told me a story that before training camp uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, it was like ninety degrees in uh, September, right? So he would drive around in his car with a with a, uh, a sweatsuit on. To lose weight. <laughs> he told me that story. A mobile sauna. No, but I mean, it was just funny. He just said, Bobby Player was one of the funniest guys I ever met in my life. He was so funny. And he told me the story about when he came down from North Bay or someplace up north. And he went to the Guelph Mad Hatters. And he walked into camp and coming from way up north. And, and you know, the, most of the guys from Ontario, locally. And he, he said to the trainer, he says, who's the toughest guy in camp? So he, he went and beat the shit out of him three times in the first two days, and he, he made the team, right? So that, that's how he, that was his mindset. He said, okay, well, who's the toughest guy here, right? Not knowing the area and shit. So anyway, uh, went down to Hershey. Actually, it was, it was a blessing in disguise because I wasn't playing much. And the team went through a coaching change. Uh, we fired um, Marcel. We fired Punch Imlac. And they wanted to bring a couple older guys. Rick Dudley came back. Uh, Dave Schultz came. 
uh, back. Uh, we got them from Pittsburgh actually at the time. So they were gonna, they were trying to go with uh, uh, a tougher team, which is what was, that's what we needed at the time. That, that was how you're gonna maybe win. So sure enough, go down to Hershey and uh, for six weeks, uh, had the best time of my life just being with a bunch of young guys my age, uh, played 25 minutes a game, scored 21 goals in 24 games, uh, got moved to center, which I figured out was a better position for me after being a winger for years. And Freddie Stanfield, who just passed away, uh, actually put me in center. He says, look, you're a centerman. You're not a winger. You should play center. So we, we had the toughest team in the league and a uh, crazy squid. I don't know if you played in Hershey. Uh, you could hear from the locker room, from our locker room into the visitor team locker room. So Archie Henderson, uh, we had five tough guys, toughest guys in the league, would be yelling at Bruce Brudrow and Bob Neely from the other, uh, hey, we're coming after you tonight. Uh, you know, fuck you, we're coming after you tonight. So they, they would call out every uh, one of the best players on the other team, Archie and, and Gary Risling and these guys. They were nuts. Uh, there was a guy from uh, Billador or somebody from Quebec. Joe Billador. Toughest yeah. guy in the league, right? So I had more room than I ever had in my life on the other. <laughs> and we'd go for warm up and Archie would bark at Brudrow and these guys from Moncton at the time. And I just remember him just yapping at the other team's uh, good players. And you could see in their faces, and I, you know, I, I know what that's like going into Philly and shit in Boston. You know what I mean? I know what that feeling's like. So these guys are just skating around going, oh, you know. <laughs> so I'm going out there, cart watch, uh, playing 25 minutes a game. I can, go, I can do anything I want. And it was a fun group of guys, and it was a small town, and we, 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 we were together every day. Only a couple of guys were married, so there's a bunch of single guys going golfing and just going to the, the same place to throw darts and, and play shuffleboard uh, every day and then get up and go to practice the next day and then keep her going. <laughs> you were there with Danny here, Jerry Martin, Jerry Smith, all those guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I got a, I got a funny story for you guys. Uh, we, we played, uh, it was Carl Brewer's first game out of retirement. Punch brought him back at 44 years old. So we're playing in the we're playing in Buffalo, and we won fourteen to four. I remember. And, uh, uh, so, so Carl was uh, his defense partner was Dave Shan, and I know I know I know Dave Shan. <laughs> so uh, sure enough, every time Carl jumped over the boards, everybody was lighting up like a pinball machine, like they wanted to get out there, right? <laughs> so at the end of the night, and I'll say something about Carl Brewer. Uh, he made me a ton of money in the eighties uh, by going after. Uh, the Eagleson and so forth uh, made a lot of money through him and his the due diligence. So Carl's minus eight, and uh, Dave Shad looked at me after the game, going, and just rolled his eyes, and I knew him, uh, right? So fourteen to four, and Terry Martin had three goals in that game for Toronto, actually a hat trick. And uh, to this day, it's still a record. Uh, the most goals scored in one period combined by two teams is ten goals, and that was that game. And, and Dick Bettles was there uh, doing CHCH that night. In that broadcast, and I saw him after the game, and he just gave me a look like a uh, like he just was wore his hat, and he was just laughing at me, and just what a night, uh, kid! And it was my first five point night actually that game. It's great. It's funny you bring that, it's funny you bring that game up. <laughs> they would go one, two, three, we go on four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember in that game they were going five, ten, we go on fifteen. <laughs> I remember uh, Squid Hutch. Hutch was there, and uh, he was yeah. he was he was pissed. Hutch was uh, Hutch didn't like losing. No, I know. I mean, but have you, uh, have you had Hutch on uh, Squid? Have you had have you had Hutch on? Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. yeah. How's he doing? How's he doing? He's doing great. He's doing great. And uh, but I remember that game. Buddy LeBron started. He got that pulled. I forget who is our other goalie was. He went in, he got pulled. Bunny went back in, Bunny got pulled again, and then they put the other guy back in. You know, <laughs> one guy might have been uh, Squid. Remember the, the, uh, the, 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 Czech, the Czech goalie you had? What was his name? Yuri Sira? Yes, yeah, Yuri Sira. It might have been Yuri Sira, maybe. I think it was, yeah. Hey, so. I remember, I remember in training camp, Yuri Sira uh, were playing an exhibition game. Yeah. The coach tells him that. You're going to go in halfway through the game at the 10 minute mark of the second period. So there's a, a delayed penalty being called against us. I mean, against the other team. And Palmer here comes racing to the bench, and you see Sierra grabbing his gloves and his mask, and he's halfway over the board. 
Hey, Squid, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story, guys, about just growing up as a diehard Leaf fan. And I, I have to say that because obviously, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm rooting for the Leafs now and going forward because uh, the Sabres obviously are going to make it. But I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to be close to Toronto and I can root for the Leafs. And most of my friends from Canada are, are just diehard Leaf fans and uh, from Ontario. The, 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 obviously, the, the Quebec people are, are, are Canadians. But anyway, uh, when I was nine years old, I'd seen the Maple Leafs win this cup five times uh, in my life by the time I was nine years old. So I just remember sitting on the couch with my dad, watching the games and watching parades, right? So sure enough, uh, my, my dad's one of the head guys in Imperial Oil in Sarnia, right? And uh, he brings Ted Ellis uh, to town to sign autographs. Uh, Ronnie Ellis, sorry. Ronnie Ellis, yeah. Right? Ronnie Ellis comes to town, right? In the summertime for our, our annual picnic, which my dad basically runs a company. So Ronnie Ellis comes and got to meet him. But in the, subsequently, I got to meet Johnny Bauer. I got to meet George Armstrong. I got to meet uh, in Florida when I bought my house there. Dave Keon and, and Ricky Lee were 10 minutes away from us at the same golf club. Uh, so I got to meet all these Leaf guys that I grew up idolizing um, from when I was a kid. And I, I told uh, Squid the quick story. And uh, with respect to Daryl Sittler, who a um, few things, he was my neighbor in Buffalo. Uh, was my neighbor in Florida, Jupiter, Florida. So we knew each other, and he actually got me into the All Star game uh, in San Jose one year. With and I played in a line with Lanny uh, McDonald and Daryl Sittler, which was great. Uh, we ended up getting a winning goal. So anyway, uh, so Sit did a, a ton of stuff for me. But uh, I, I told a story to Squid about when they closed the gardens, and I asked Squid if he was there, and he said he was coaching. So when they closed the gardens, there are hundred the, the hundred people I watched on TV. Yeah. And Hutch, Hutch was there, and we were, I was with the alumni there in Pelican, and Pelican. I'm talking to those guys right all the time. So sure enough, I'm watching, and, and so sure enough, uh, I think Daryl and Eddie Shack were some of the last guys to come out, right? So uh, Sit turns to uh, or Eddie turns to Sit, and he says, "Sit, uh, sit did you want to borrow one of my rings to wear out for the introduction?" And uh, so Sit says. Uh, Eddie, he says, uh, some of some of us uh, we're, we're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. So Eddie says three fucking times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now speaking of uh, right time, right place, Tony. We ask this. It usually Squid asks this question, but I'm, I'll steal it today. We ask every guest: Was there a game, a goal, or a moment that occurred that you looked at yourself and said, "I've made it." Uh, I scored a goal in my first game in the second period um, in Buffalo. And ironically, I think there's only five people who have done that. Danny Garrett being one of them, and Gilbert Perot, uh, Richard Martin, and I'm not sure who the – anyway, uh, it, that's a rarity. So, yeah, your first game and, and you know, uh, the whole – back then, Squid, you remember, the team used to spill off the bench for an important goal, and everybody came off the bench. You know, my first game, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a teenager, right? Um, so it, that, that to me is my favorite memory. The other memory I have, I scored a, a, a goal to win the series against Montreal, uh, when Montreal was, uh, just getting out of their heyday. Like, uh, the Fleur was sort of on the outs, uh, get, uh, Larry Robinson. So their mainstay guys were just on the way, uh, down, if you will. And that was in Buffalo. And, and uh, anyway, uh, that, that's a, a memorable goal for me. And I was going to ask Squid, what, what's your favorite goal, Squid, out of? 400 and change if you have them I, well i mean obviously the first 50 goal 50th goal yep. is a big one but, but my first nhl goal was, was this was important to me uh that was when i kind of and it was a goal that i normally didn't score i came down the wing and i got kind of cut off by the d so i cut right across to the slot and i scored on a backhand mm -hmm. over the goalies shoulder and i mean uh, like i probably scored two of those in my whole career yeah. <laughs> and my first nhl goal just happened to be like that <laughs> hey now tony for the younger uh, listeners yeah, uh, i was gonna, gonna uh, i would get one more thing to say is that uh the first time i scored 20 goals uh was sort of a milestone because you had a, everybody had a bonus for 20 
And so back then, you know, you're making a hundred grand or something and, and uh, five grand was a lot of money back then uh, to get 20, right? So that, that was sort of my deal. Uh, and then, uh, so that's the 20th goal. Then the first time he scored 30, the first time he scored 40. Uh, so I, I guess those are the numbers to think about. And I can, I can certainly recant, uh, remember those goals uh, we're talking about. I remember exactly what they were because I did a lot of video tapes I can watch them, uh, from back in the day. Now, uh, Tony, for our younger listeners. Okay, hold on, Tony. Before, oh. before he asked you the question, I don't even know how he got those bonuses because I had no bonuses until last. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I'm not kidding. On my first contract, I had no bonuses except for a signing bonus. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't get a bonus in my contract for the amount of goals or anything until after I scored 33 goals in my second season. Yeah. Then I started getting bonuses for, for X amount of goals. But, I mean, I didn't have any for 50. Uh, it was like 30, 35, 40, yeah. and that was pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, Squid, funny, funny story about bonuses. Uh, it was in New York with, uh, with Willie Hugh. It was in New York with So sure enough, uh, I got to New York, and I, I scored – uh, on a rapid pace, uh, first 15 or 20 games, I had uh, 10 or 15 goals. Like, you know, so sure enough, I'm negotiating with Phil to extend my contract. So I found out that Willie Huber had a bonus for 10 grand to keep his weight under 230, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and then he also had a bone, or he had his own hotel room, which nobody had on the road, right? And which is back then, it was that that was a rarity unless you were a goalie and on game day, if you were a goalie, right? Yeah. Like, so nobody else, everybody was partnering up. So, sure enough, I'm talking to Phil and I said, Phil, um, what about giving me 10 grand if I still, if, if I stay black till the end of the year? I <laughs> 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 you know, Phil and I were just laughing about it. I said, I, I talked about Willie's bonus. I said, Yeah, I heard about Willie's bonus there. Uh, what, what do you think? <laughs> Um, Tony, I was gonna, by the way, what you better get Wilbur on the phone right after this, uh, squid and have a chat with him. The, um, I was going to ask, you know, for the younger listeners who can only identify state of the art facilities today, what were some of your favorite memories playing at the odd, you know, with the steep staircases, the wobbly boards, the great acoustics. I mean, it had it all. Well, you know, what? uh, back in the day when, and squid remembers when I first started just, just one year before, no squid, we came in the same year. I know you're in Birmingham, right? And then anyway, so I just thought that every rink was unique. I thought Boston was unique. I thought Buffalo was unique. I thought Toronto, Maple Leaf Gardens, my God, growing up uh, watching that. Montreal, 22 banners. Uh, every arena had some sort of, uh, like Chicago, uh, you're going into New York, Madison Square Garden. Like at every stop during that yeah. time when there were, there were 12 teams and 16. And then the Quebec it was interesting. Uh, Winnipeg was interesting with that big picture of the Queen up there. Queen. Uh, Ed- Edmonton started to come, you know what I mean? Small town that got bigger with SCTV yeah. and with uh, the Oilers going there, right? And then Vancouver, great yeah. city to go to, visit. So, so to me, L.A. was interesting. Uh, to go to L.A. in the middle of winter, it was 65 degrees, and I'd go to Malibu, uh, rent a car, and I'd go to, you know, uh, Hollywood or something. So every every stop was just – Atlanta was interesting to go to back in the day, the weather, the this – in fact, Squid, I remember when Hume Rigsy uh, drove over to watch his play in Atlanta uh, to see Marshy. Yeah. Do you remember driving over uh, with Rammer yeah. and everybody and Hartsey? Uh, you came to watch his play in Atlanta from Birmingham. Uh, and we went back to uh, Marshy's uh, girlfriend's father on the bar there. We went there afterwards. Now, I was going to say. Well, the, but one, the one thing I remember about the odd was uh, yeah. when he dumped it in to the visitor's team in the second period and it was coming around the boards Porky, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of like assistant uh equipment guy yeah porky porky palmer he would, he would toss his foot against the boards and it would the puck would hit and it would pop right out in the slot a so squid, squid the was, it was his whole body squid it was whole the porky was big it was his whole body against oh the yeah board and the boards right but the puck would hit that and go directly into the slot so yeah. we knew that if if it was dumped in on that side, go to the slot because that's where it's going to end up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know that, Squid. Uh, nobody told me that when I was playing against you, pricks. <laughs> <laughs> now, Tony, what about that uh, song, The Saber Dance? Probably the most 
irritating song for opposing fans to listen to, but you guys must have loved it. I mean, it's actually was one of a kind. Well, it was interesting because the uh, the owners of the team were older people and they were really into jazz and they were just into history. And their family was like four generations of some of the richest people in New York State, Buffalo, for sure. So they had this tradition thing. Uh, and when I came, uh, they had a song called The Best Is Yet to Come by Frank Sinatra. So they were always into this theme thing. Yeah. And then uh, the, the Sabre dance thing, just that was sort of the, the team was called the Sabre. So there you go. And the fans got into it. Like it was, did, 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 did. so it got you. Oh, God. Came and the, the, the organ player was able to play that song on the organ. <laughs> and Squid, I remember Chicago, and I love being in Chicago because of the organ player there. Oh, like yeah. that's so unique. And we talk about Chicago and the different things. Remember the organ guy at the end? Like, like that's incredible. Like there's that that isn't in baseball, it's not in basketball. Yeah, it's in hockey. Uh the guy playing the organ at the end there. So now it was a it was an amazing thing when we were in the playoffs in Chicago and, and uh uh Wayne Mesmer who sang the national anthem. Uh, yeah, he's the guy. And the guy's playing the organ, you and the fans were so loud, you could not hear him singing the last half of the Star Spangled yeah. Banner. It was, it was unbelievable. Yep. Yeah. Nothing like it. Now, no. Tony, after five years in Buffalo, you're moved to go back along with Savard and J.F. Swab for a third round pick for, uh, along with a third round pick for Real Cloutier and a first round pick. How did yeah, you find that? So, I think it's Solve, Mike. Solve, yeah, sorry. Uh, J. JF My French isn't very good. Sorry, boys. Yeah, uh, um, uh, how did you find out your initial thoughts? Anyway, uh, Jean-Francois Sauvé. Um, and uh, we I'll tell you a funny story. He was five foot eight and just a little pistol. Good player, but he just wasn't that big, right? So sure enough, uh, we're in Hartford, and a scrum happens in front of the net. So it's me and Malcolm Harvey and this J.F. Sauvé who started the whole thing, and then McGarrett's there, uh, John Garrett, the goalie. We're in Hartford, and uh, probably uh, Boot Boot Booters there, Pat Boutet, right? So there's a scrum, and uh, McElhurry funny says, he says, "Look, could you get Tattoo out of here right now, Tony?" <laughs> so his nickname became Tattoo after that, right? So uh, sure enough, um, uh, my my agent called me one hour before Scotty Bowman to tell me the trade happened with Quebec. And by the way, the draft pick became Adam Cre Adam Creighton Crates. Uh, Squid, you remember? So anyway, that was the guy in the first round pick that went along with uh, Kluche. So we out Kluche played one year after that uh, in the league, right? Uh, I played another 10. Uh, Andre Savard played uh, three or four more and then J.F. Sobe. But I mean, the trade basically was for me, for the pick, and for Kluche. Uh, that was pretty much it. But I mean, uh, I love going to Quebec um, uh, during the times we visited there and played against them. The restaurants are great and never thought about living there. And then once I got to live there, you realize that it's not a bad place. It was Canada. Uh, the taxes were extremely high, uh, crazy high. And I figured out a way around that because uh, I had homes in the States. But I mean, uh, it was just an experience where people uh, were proud of their heritage and um, they appreciated the fact that I learned to speak French and spoke French with them. And they, they just appreciated I was making an effort. My French was not very good, but I mean, they appreciated the fact that I, I tried uh, to speak French. And uh, Don Cherry actually nicknamed me uh, the Grand Noir, Noir, excuse me. And they, that's what they called me in Quebec. So uh, Don Cherry said on a Hockey Night Canada one day, he says, yeah, they call him the Grand Noir here. We were playing Montreal in the playoffs one year. And a great rivalry. We were talking to Squid about the fact that, do you imagine Quebec not having a team Yes. Uh, in that province with that rivalry, and they've got a building there like Winnipeg. And uh, Phoenix has drawn 8,000. Well, they're always the rumored uh, candidate for either an existing struggling franchise like Ottawa or an expansion team. So it won't be long, I don't think, before they're back in the league. I just want, I want to see them play Montreal, Montreal eight times a year. That's what I want to see. Oh. And everybody in that province would want to see Absolutely. Them. Now, now you you played you saw it from playing in Buffalo and going in there when you started living it in Quebec. How was yeah. that? How was that playing Montreal? Like with the whole city behind? Like was it just nuts? It was uh, heightened uh, certainly versus Buffalo. Um, it and, and a straight crazy story. My friend was head of uh, Carling O'Keefe, uh, who owned our team, right? So I I, I know him. Uh, so sure enough, he told me if uh, b between us winning against Montreal. 
the beer sales will go up in the summertime times double. <laughs> Montreal and Montreal is owned by Molson's. And the guy explained to me that when we beat them one summer, the beer sales went up by double for Carling O'Keefe versus Molson's. So it came down to a hockey series as far as the beer sales in the province of Quebec. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. And uh, I was telling uh, uh, Squid that uh, Dave Bichette told me, who's head of our alumni in Quebec, that uh, Montreal doesn't want another hockey team uh, in that province. They want to own it. <laughs> they want to own it. It's money. They want to own it. I mean, I can see that from their yeah. standpoint. I mean, they, they, you know, they wouldn't want another team a couple of hours away. But at the same time, it, I don't think they're looking at the big picture in that they're going to play them six or seven times or eight times a year, and it's going to be a great rival. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to make them a lot more money. I was going to say, guys, that, that when that trade happened for Patrick Waugh, there was no way they were going to trade him to Quebec. Uh, they trade him to Colorado because uh, of Claire Lacroix, right? So they trade him so they don't have to see him uh, maybe more than once or twice a year, maybe, right? So, he, so Patrick Waugh goes there and wins two Stanley Cups, leaving Quebec, or Montreal, excuse me. Uh, but he never would have got traded to Quebec Nordiques. Uh, that never would have happened. Now, after Quebec, you end up in Minnesota. How did that come about? And were you starting to wonder, I go to these places I produce and they keep moving me. But the good well, thing is teams uh, want you. Yeah, that, that would be the thing because there were some guys that sort of went by the wayside and uh, nobody wanted to pick them up. Uh, maybe the age factor, uh, numbers went down, uh, minors, two-way contract, a lot of factors. But, um, you know, I was happy to go back to the States at the time. I, I just, um, anyway. I was really happy to go to uh, back to the USA. Uh, my wife is American, uh, and uh, my son actually was born in Minnesota, uh, uh, strangely. Um, so it was just a great experience to be. And, and Squid, do you remember how nice Minnesota was to go to, even as an away player? Do you remember? Did you like it there? Oh, I loved it. I think yeah, well, I, I did too. They had a great, a couple of great restaurants and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, it was called Webster's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep, and the Coastal Hotel. Uh, funny story for you, uh, Danny Gare. Uh, everybody went to that place you're talking about, Eddie Webster's, right? Uh, from the hotel Marriott, five minutes shuttle. So Danny Gare is just going to get some rest. We're on the road, and he went to put his uh, room service tray out in the hallway, and the door shut behind him and locked, no key. Uh, he's got nothing on but a towel. <laughs> Marriott Squid across from the Met Center. So we're in the back of the hotel with a bank of rooms, right? So he's got to make his way to the lobby uh, to get a key with a towel at like we're all we're all at Eddie Webster's having peanuts, like you said, right? The crest, you know, the whole thing. So uh, tickets is stuck uh, in the hallway and nobody's around because we're all at the place. Right? So uh, he told us the story the next day. And that, that's a great thing about hockey is that. When something happens, the, the boys can't wait to tell somebody the story. Uh, say, hey, do you know what happened to me you know, last night? And they, hey, remember, where'd you go? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, so who were the biggest pranksters you ever played with? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Dougie Gilmore was uh, oh. uh, incredible. Uh, oh, his name comes up all the all time. time. <laughs> Uh, he he uh, he did a thing, Squid. It was hilarious. Uh, we had uh, two young Swedish guys on our team in St. Louis and didn't say a word if they if they had their mouth full of shit. So sure enough, uh, Jacques Martin, the go the coach, loved Diet Coke and had a case of it in his fridge in the coach's room every day. And just all he drank was Diet Coke, no coffee, no wasn't a, a drinker of alcohol. So sure enough, uh, Killer takes the whole contents of the fridge and puts it in the sweet stalls. So Jacques Martin comes in and he says, who the fuck took my uh, Diet Cokes? And this, Dougie put it in the sweet stalls, right? So uh, sure enough, uh, Brian Sutter uh, uh, buys it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was Dougie that uh, uh, getting back from Brian Sutter. Uh, bought a really nice pair of shoes, very expensive. And uh, we come in uh, after the morning skate, and Brian Sutter had nailed these shoes to the top of the bunk. You know, you're, you're stalled, right? <laughs> and uh, he comes in, and then so Dougie, uh, he found out I had a bonus for 40 goals for 15 grand, getting back to the bonus thing squid. 
So I told uh, Tony Herkitz, my center man, and I might have talked to Bernie for Draco. I said, hey, if I get a 40th goal here, like three games left, right? I got 38 or 39. And I said, if I get 40, uh, geez, I'm going to make 15 grand and blah, blah, blah. So Dougie takes the garbage disposal. We're in Edmonton. Uh, the garbage can, which is yay high, right? And he put dollar signs all over it and put it in my stall. <laughs> like basically, you know, they found out I was going to get 15 grand. And sure enough, I got the 40th goal in the last game of the season on the, on the last shift. I get it in Winnipeg, right? Tip, tip in with like 40 seconds left or something. So I get the 40, uh, 15 grand. Uh, but Dougie, yeah, Dougie put the dollar sign on there. But the other trick he did when the aluminum sticks were out, uh, he used to fill up uh, myself with Brett Hall, where the first two guys used aluminum sticks um, in St. Louis, uh, Easton, by the way, and Christian. So anyway, so Dougie puts water in the stick, right, and then puts a top on, and then you know you're tilting it up or something, and then the water splashes all over somebody's face, right, because he put it up with water. <laughs> He just, uh, you know what he used to do? It was amazing. He used to go, there was an elevator that took him to St. Louis Arena up to the rafters uh, for the press, uh, right up to the press box. So Dougie would take a stick and tape, and he would sit up there and just look at the rink for 20 minutes by himself. And he'd come down, and he was ready. He got the head going, but he, he just wanted, he wanted to see the ice. And I'd, I'd never seen anybody do that before. He went right up to the top of that stadium and sat by himself quietly with a coffee. Uh, the big thing I remember about St. Louis, the rink there, is that we played there in the playoffs in the first round the one year. Well, I, I was there, Scott. I, was there. I mean, it was crazy. The ice was like like slush almost. No, no, uh, Squid, it was, uh, I was there. I was there that year, Squid. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was crazy. So, uh, Tony... Who was uh, who was an underrated player or players that you played with who aren't recognized enough? You think in today? You know what? Uh, there, there's so many guys that are just team players that are role players that are just guys that are just great in the locker room. Uh, that were good to have around. It might have been your fourth line guy, but it was just made made yep. guys laugh. Uh, was a hard worker. Would st stick up for anybody. Uh, so there's a lot of those guys that would, would drop uh, or just, you know, come to the, the defense of anybody on the team. Might have been your 19th guy. Um, and as far as regular players, um, you know, if there's so many guys in Squid, you know, as long as we play, you, you, I, the, the list is, is endless as far as how many guys that you came uh, through and by in junior. And when you're playing that long, uh, you know, playing top level uh, yeah. travel hockey, you're playing uh, top level junior A, junior B, and then you're playing the NHL. And, and it's like, geez, I remember that guy and, and just, you know, and a couple of guys that got injured, unfortunately, that didn't have a longer career. Uh, and the concussion thing, you know, um, altered a lot of guys' career and, and just the injury thing. But I mean, uh, it's tough to pick up one guy. Uh, well, names like Steve Larmer show up a lot. Guys mention well, yeah. him. Stevie Larmer, but I mean, to me, uh, he's not underrated to me. Uh, one of the best players they ever played with. Uh, so, and, and I know that, but I mean, the average fan, I, I know where you're going. Yeah. Uh, might not think of a Stevie Larmer like we do, uh, knowing that, you know, I, I saw him every day um, a lot. But how, but and Tony, just, how, how is this guy, Tony, how is Steve Larmer not in the Hall of Fame? Well, that's another name, uh, Squid. Another name in that list of things that you're talking about, Stanley Cup winner, which I think is part of the criteria. Like my, my stats were similar than Clark to Clark, Clark Gillies and maybe more so. And uh, he won four Stanley Cups. I didn't win one. Uh, Stevie Larmer won a Stanley Cup. Chicago, uh, 100 but points. But he also won a Calder. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's true. And, and, and Squid, uh, that, that's a guy whose name, along with yours, and Rick Middleton and so forth, that's exactly, he's in that same club. If, in my mind, having been there to play, see these guys up front and personal. It's kind of funny because I, I've always thought that perhaps Stanley Cup should not be included when you're picking yep. a player for the Hall of Fame. Yep. You and know, Squid, on, that, on that point, Squid, and I hate to interrupt you. Individual uh, awards, yes. Yeah. In my, in my, the Stanley Cup's no. Yeah. In my years, uh, when I got to the league, Squid, uh, Montreal won the Cup four times. Edmonton won a cup four times. Uh, I remember four times. Uh, Calgary once. Uh, Pittsburgh twice. So if I wasn't on one of those teams out of 21 teams, yep. uh, 
and you weren't moving around back then with free agency. Like you finish your contract. Like I, when I was 28, I scored 40 goals. I could have signed with somebody like you could today, right? I could, I, hey, geez, so how much is New York offering or whatever? Uh, if free agency, what it was, I might have moved to some place after scoring yeah. goals. But I mean, back then, you just, you know, you just played. You're 32 years old. Yeah. Free agency. I mean, a lot of guys were done by then. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, and interesting, uh, Squid, uh, my first year, first few years, uh, the average length of a career was five and a half years uh, because some guys played, you know, uh, 50 games, other guys, you know, whatever. So that was the average uh, career span, five and a half years back then uh, when I started. And then it, it went up a little bit since then, probably. So I had five years. I was lucky to play five years. I wanted to play 10. I thought about 10. I said, OK, do it under five. When I got to 10, I thought, well, physically, just stay in shape. Don't get hurt. You can play to your uh, 15 years. And that's exactly what I did. 15 years. Well, yeah, that's a pretty damn good career. I'll say it is. Well, Tony, we don't want to keep you all day. We can't thank you enough for joining us today. But uh, before we let Tony go, Squid, any final thoughts? Hmm. No, I just, uh, you know what? I have a lot of fond memories of playing hockey over my lifetime. And I, I got to say that probably one of the biggest ones was that first World Juniors when they picked the first All-Star team. And I got to play with Tony and all these great players, and, you know, Gretzky and Mike Gardner. And, and that, to me, was an unbelievable experience. As an 18-year-old, to be able to go play with those guys, it was great. Yeah, well, it's great uh, for you guys, Squid, is that, you, like Gretzky, uh, you found out that you could play with the best of the RH group uh, yeah. from Canada and, and even the world, uh, if you look at the checks. Yeah. We, we didn't think they were coming over back then, right? So that my only thought was the, uh, the the guys on the Canadian team as far as getting drafted. I didn't even think about Stassi's or the guys were yeah. playing. No. That was uh, nominally that they were going to come over. But, I mean, yeah. for, for me, um, to, to be around those guys – and uh, we, 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 we got along well. Everybody got along well. And, and as, as Squid mentioned, we're, we're in the Montreal Canadiens locker room. I'm sitting in Guy Lafleur's stall uh, looking up at uh, his name uh, in the Montreal Canadiens locker room. It's unbelievable. And, no, but I mean, like, what a treat for, the, for a 19-year-old kid. Uh, and they were right in the middle of winning four Stanley Cups. And I watched them on the French Channel every Wednesday, and I watched them every Saturday in Montreal, uh, excuse me, Hockey Night Canada from from uh, Kingston, excuse me. Uh, those are the games I saw uh, twice a week. Uh, and uh, the guys were uh, nice. Uh, everybody treated us, and, and just in passing. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty much it, as I recall. Uh, but well, I remember... One time I was just walking around. I saw their weight chart on the wall. Yeah. I started looking at it, and, I'm look, and they had their defense and their forwards. Well, Giga Point was their smallest defenseman at six foot one, two hundred and twenty-five pounds. Really? Everybody was bigger than him. No kidding. And I mean, and Larry Robinson. I mean, yeah. Wow. I mean, they, Oh, yep. Rick Chartrod, Larry Robinson, Charlie, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. And uh, the other guy was the, the guy that uh, went to Washington, uh, Rod Langway. Rod Langway, yeah, yep. Rod yeah. Langway, yeah. yeah. And I, I believe that uh, Savard was still playing at that point. Uh, he was there, Squid. He would have been, all those guys would have been there. Uh, yeah. Everyone you've talked about uh, would have been still there. Uh, Andre Richard was still there. Yep. He retired the following year, my first year. Yeah. That's, uh, it's pretty impressive when you're an 18 year old kid or a 19 year old kid and you get to go into that environment. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, guys, that was uh, uh, great to be on. It was really nice. Yes. Uh, it's a really nice format and nice stuff. And I'm looking forward to the game tonight. It's sort of, it's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, at about four in the afternoon, I'm thinking, okay, I'm just counting. The, uh, I get up at five in the morning, unfortunately. And I'm just looking forward to watching the game. I, I, I really enjoy the game today. Um, I enjoy watching the highlights. I think the commentators uh, are really good. Um, I find I find it enjoyable. I think there's a couple girls that are doing commentating that know what they're talking about with the hockey on the NFL.com that I get. And I, I just uh, I think the guys are good, and they're I like hockey in Canada and the production. I, I just think it's 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 fun to watch. Well, fantastic. Well, listen, Tony, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. 
Best of luck with the documentary. We can't wait. Can't wait to see it when it does come out. Oh, guys, here's uh, here's Johnny again. And you got Johnny in the picture. <laughs> well, we could use him tonight. Where I got the second goal he's going in tonight against Buffalo. So. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Um, they might not need the second goal tonight. Maybe. <laughs> well, Owen Power is playing for Buffalo tonight, so it's his debut. So uh, we'll see how he does. Yeah, uh, fun, fun to watch. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Thanks again for joining us, Tony, and all the best going forward. Hey, guys. Uh, Thanks, great. man. Sweet. Thanks,